Welcome to the final masterclass of 2024, the BizHack Live Masterclass Series funded by Strive 305 in Miami-Dade County. My name is Dan Gretsch. I'm the CEO and founder of BizHack Academy and your host for this series. What an amazing year it's been. Um, those of you who've been here from the beginning know uh, we did an incredible series of masterclasses, if I may say so myself, 11 masterclasses on AI. Really excited to announce that we're going to continue, uh, we're going to come back to the AI theme and focus on content creation, SEO, pay-per-click, uh, with uh, Jeff Cooper from Saltbox. We'll talk about that at the end of today, but just wanted to give you guys for coming on time a, a little bit of a preview of what's coming. If you remember Jeff from the AI course that we did in the spring, uh, go ahead and uh, say something in the chat. Um, Jeff and I are still putting together the the, the series, but it's going to be really focused on SEO, search engine optimization, and content creation using AI tools. Um, search has been completely upended by uh, by AI, and uh, I'm very excited to dig in. Right now, we're contemplating eight masterclasses on the topic, giving you a full range of knowledge from the basics of SEO all the way to the most advanced AI tools that you can leverage. So really excited to have that. I, I want to I wanna tell you guys, like when we talk about AI, a lot more people come and AI is an important tool. But the thing that we're going to talk about today is actually the thing that will fundamentally transform your business and make you successful, which is finances. So it's a little bit of an eat your broccoli uh, topic. Uh, it's, it's As you'll see, there are a lot of slides with a lot of numbers on them. But I'm very excited that we have Eric Cruz, one of the nation's leading experts in how you can use um, finances to drive strategy. So we're going to talk a lot about that in a sec. Um, first, uh, I did want to share, we have two um, really exciting training opportunities. And um, we're going to launch a quick poll now. Um, let me see. Uh-oh. Uh, let me see if this is the right poll. No, we have the wrong poll right now, John, uh, in in the let me in check. here. So we'll need to recreate the one that we need. Um, uh, I think I might have inadvertently deleted it. Um, so there are two things that we have that I wanted you guys to be aware of. Number one is we're running a series of scholarships um, for a course in AI-powered Facebook advertising. And we have about 10 left. I just got off the phone with another scholarship recipient. Um, she's a doctor who runs her own private clinic. Um, it is a extraordinary opportunity. This is BizHack signature course. We've been running it for seven years, had more than 700 businesses, and we're completely remaking it um, to, to accommodate uh, all of the AI tools that Meta, Facebook's parent company, has started to build inside of the platform. And it is really exciting. And the course starts on January 22nd, and it's a boot camp. It's an intense, uh, you can do it while still running your business, but it's an intense experience with one-on-one -on -one coaching. It's a $3,500 offering, and we have $3,000 scholarships that bring the price down to $500. We call that a commitment fee. And um, if you're based in Miami-Dade County, you are eligible for this. We already have more than 25 businesses that have opted in. Uh, we have about 10 scholarships left and we will be selling out. Uh, I'm doing everything I can to sell them out by Christmas so I can have a great holiday. So that's the first training opportunity. The second is um, BizHack is part of our mission is we serve business support organizations like Chambers of Commerce. And so if you're a part of a business support organization, you know, EO, a networking group, BNI, and you want to bring me as a speaker, we do it uh, for free as a give back to the community. And we would love for you to um, help co coordinate an introduction, and we'd be happy to do that. Uh, no, and that is not limited to Miami-Dade County. That's for anyone nationwide. Um, you know, we are based in Miami, and we are funded by Miami-Dade County, uh, Office of the Mayor, Daniela Levine Cava. She has a initiative called the Future Ready Initiative, which is an extraordinary uh, attempt to create a 21st century workforce in Miami. Um, and one of the parts of that initiative is Strive 305, uh, BizHack has five free courses uh, on Strive 305, uh, one on AI, one on lead generation, and one on thought leadership. And the one in lead generation is in three languages, Spanish and Creole included. 
So if you're based uh, anywhere, you have access to these through the virtual incubator at Strive 305. If you go to the Strive 305 website on Miami-Dade County, you'll get access to that incubator. And we're actually um, updating and putting out new versions of those courses uh, this week. And we're also supported by and promoted by the public library system here in Miami-Dade County. Uh, our media sponsor is South Florida PBS. I'm a former public radio, public television person. And then we have more than two dozen community partners who help promote uh, our offerings, our free and discounted offerings to their members. Um, as many of you know, I'm a former journalist turned marketer turned educator. And uh, we've been doing this masterclass series since the depths of COVID seven, uh, seven weeks after uh, we went into lockdown. Um, we started the masterclass series. We've done more than 100 of them. Most of them were unfunded. Uh, eventually, uh, we got a bunch of national awards and recognition for it, and the Miami-Dade County stepped in to help uh, make this a continuing service, and we're very grateful for that. Today, we're going to be talking about financial planning that drives business growth. The instructor is Eric Cruz of Cruz & Company. Cruz & Company is a consulting firm that specializes in helping small businesses, medium-sized businesses use financial planning and financial tools to grow faster. And they really specialize in creating the necessary uh, vision and view into growth and using finances as a path to do that. One of the extraordinary things that Eric has taught me as we prepare today's masterclass is that the single most important thing you need when you plan is a financial metric that you can point to and orient everyone against. And this is actually one of the things, you know, I come from a media background and a nonprofit background. And when I started in business, I actually find the profit orientation of for-profits of businesses very clarifying because it's very easy to know if you're being successful. Are you making money profitably? And so today we're gonna to talk about how do you set those North Star metrics uh, to allow yourself to grow profitably um, and make sure that while you're doing good, you're also doing well. Because the bottom line is, if you don't do well, if you don't have money in the bank, if you don't have the lifeblood of any company, which is ready cash, uh, you will go out of business. You will die. The one way that the companies die is they run out of money. And so today is all about helping you make sure that you don't run out of money. And Eric Cruz is going to talk about that. Now, Eric. Uh, is himself the founder and CEO of a consultancy, Cruz & Company, that has worked with more than 100 organizations. He's going to talk about a couple of them um, in his uh, talk. Eric is also just a really clear-eyed communicator about finances and financial stuff. And so we're going to be in conversation today trying to take what can be a little bit of an intimidating topic for many business owners uh, and try to bring it uh, down to a level that you can appreciate. Um, the learning objectives, by, by the way, Eric, if you could turn your camera on, uh, it's, you're, you're pretty much up. Um, so uh, the learning objectives today is we wanna build a vision for your business, that's really important, but without a realistic financial plan to get you from here to there, that vision will be hard to achieve. Um, financial planning is the lifeblood of any growing business. And so what you will learn today is how to integrate financial planning uh, to drive success in your company. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Eric. Uh, Dan, can you hear me? Yeah, but we can't see you. I don't have the ability to turn my video on. Am I listed as a panelist? Nope, you're a panelist. Huh. Actually, know. uh. Are, He's actually talking permitted, but he's not a panelist. We need to promote him to panel, John. You have to do that because I am extremely good looking. If they don't see it, it's the presentation scores are going to plummet. Yeah, no, I, I, we've identified the issue. You need to come in as, as a panelist. John. Sorry about that. And um, uh, if you could go ahead and change your name uh, from Nicolette Marshall to your name, uh, that would be great. Um, and the way the way to do that is when you click the participants uh, and you see your if you hover over your name, it'll say more and then it allows you to rename. I don't have that view right now, Dan. I, I can't see. Uh, let me see. Uh, I think I can actually rename you. So we're good. 
Okay. Uh, Eric Cruz, Cruz and Co. All right, we are ready to go. Awesome. Welcome. Good to see you. Um, good. Uh, did you want me to share my screen or are you going to be sharing yours? I, I am more than happy to share mine. Uh, while I'm sharing mine, I just want to say I take particular issue with you saying this is not as exciting as AI because I think this is exceptionally more exciting than AI. Sounds good. Uh, you'll, you'll, you'll have to prove me wrong. Um, John, is, um, is his volume coming in a little low for you? Because it is for me. Can you hear me? Uh, we can yeah, hear I can hear you. Yeah, your volume is a little low. Uh, is there a way for you to get closer to the microphone? Uh, I think I'm right on it. Can you, can't, you can't hear me clearly, huh? We can hear you clearly. It's The volume is too low. Huh. Um, I actually it, don't know. I've never Do you have a it. microphone or are you just using the internal mic of your... Um, yep, just using the internal mic. I don't think I've ever had this issue before, actually. That, uh, I, can, that, I can talk louder. Um, yeah, just project and, and we'll do our best. We can, boost it in, we can boost it in post-production. Okay, I'll talk louder. Is this better? Can you hear me now? Is this it's good? still low. It's still oh. low. Okay. Um, oh, so sorry, guys. I've never had this issue before. All right. So I'm gonna talk as loudly as I possibly can. So our learning objectives here, financial planning that drives business growth. We're gonna focus on uh, three things. Building a vision for your business is very important, but without a realistic financial plan to get you from here to there, that vision is gonna be very, very hard to achieve. Financial planning is the lifeblood of any growing business. And you're gonna to learn today how to integrate financial planning to drive success in your company. And I'm going to say also, I am um, uh, I am definitely versed in finance for certain, um, but I'm a regular entrepreneur. I'm a CEO. I don't have a finance background. I, in fact, focused on creating these tools because I've done a lot of business and I've done it the wrong way financially. And I want to make sure we teach CEOs that don't have a finance background how to actually do it the right way. So let's dive in. First of all, for... The purposes of Cruise & Co, just as an example for us, this is a starter for us. We've worked with over, we work with about 130 companies right now. And for this year, 10% of our clients have made the Inc. 5000 list, including two of our own companies. 25% of our clients are on pace to double every three years. So how does this happen? Uh, we have some pretty good systems and all that, but let's, we're, we're not geniuses. We're really just typical entrepreneurs who have found out some things that work quite well in business. So first, let's start out by what growth really looks like. And we have a slide here that we have uh, basically stolen from, from Vern Harnish, the, the genius who wrote the book, Scaling Up. He had this phenomenal slide that we love, and that really is the centerpiece of our business. And it talks about the phases that businesses go through. And you probably, as business owners that you're listening to this, are going to see yourself in some of this, but he talks about the first phase where you're a smaller business, you're under 500 grand, and you typically have your one to three employees, and that's your first level. You got to get over that hump. Your next level is your 750 to 3 million. Your next hump is your 5 million to 12 million, 20 to 30, 40 to 125, and 700 to a billion. Now, what people think is that there's this just basically linear, vertical, or snaking kind of mysterious curve uh, up when you grow a company, and it's just not true. Businesses actually encounter actual humps, and between those those growth plateaus they hit are with these things called what we call danger zones. And our growth method is designed to help companies get over those danger zones. And let's talk about how we do that. So we built a business operating system called the growth method, and it focuses on three main things: people strategy, operations, and then what we're going to talk about today, which really sits on top of all that, and that is finance. Finance, in our opinion, is, is the scorecard that makes sure that everything else is going well. Our firm focuses on three things, profit, valuation, increasing profit, increasing valuation, increasing revenue. And if you can focus on those three things, people, operations, and strategy, and you're watching finance, you're gonna be in pretty good shape as a company. So let's dive into how we do that specifically. And Dan, feel free to push back on any and all of this. All right, so we start with the backbone of our approach. 
like many operating systems, we have a cadence that we believe you got to you got to kind of stay in. So on top of this whole financial approach that I'm going to show you in a minute, you got to have a, a, a cadence of some kind surrounding it. And for us in our system, we focus on what we call the North Star. And you're going to see an example of this in a minute. That's your big five to 10 year vision. We focus on a three year plan, a one year plan, a quarterly plan, and then on weekly planning. And like most systems, we believe this is kind of the cadence you want to be in to really nail your goal setting structure. Now let's dive this into finances. So I take this and I break this into finance. We add, we start to add in revenue targets. Now, Dan brought up a great statement earlier. He said, you got to have something that frames where you're going financially. Now it's interesting. And you're going to see this as I go through the slides here. I care, certainly, we, we measure ourselves based on revenue, profit, and valuation, certainly. But we really care about just running a, a fantastic business, and we like the numbers to help guide us to where we're going. So in this case, we're going to show you an example of a company that their big goal, their North Star, is to try and hit $45 million in revenue. So in this company's example, they're going for, for $45 million financially. Three-year objectives, financially, they're going for 15 million. Annual objectives, they're going for 6.9. Quarterly, 1.5. And all of this is tracked weekly on a scorecard. And we're going to show you how this cascades. So in a minute, you're going to see, what does this vision look like? But this is a finance webinar. So specifically, we want you to look at this and say, how do I, how do I get a vision for where I'm going financially? So once you start putting numbers on this vision, you start to say, Oh, now I see what this company is really going to look like. So let's keep diving in. Now, once we get that vision, we work on on three three big ways of setting goals. We use a system called. Sorry, I'm 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 so sorry. I just wanted to interrupt because I I wanted. Can you go back to the previous slide? Absolutely. And I really apologize for um I, I've been having some technical difficulties. Okay. So first of all, I want to just unpack some of what you've said because um. So, so you said there are three things you're looking to increase, and I assume they're in order: uh, profit, valuation, and revenue. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. So, I want to start by the first two, the the first and the third. So, there's revenue, right, which is how much money you make, and profit, which is how much money you take home, right? Yes. And you know, there's a wonderful book called Profit First, which is the idea that too much, too many of us are, are focused on top line, which is revenue, how many sales we get. And they feel great when you break the million dollar mark. Even that, if you go back a couple more slides, even that slide is talking about top line revenue. It's not talking about profitability. So yeah. um, so, so I most of you understand the difference between revenue and profit, but the thing in the middle valuation, could you define what valuation is? Absolutely. So before I even answer that question, Dan, I'm going to tell you, I couldn't have answered that question 15 years ago. I'm 53, exactly. years, old. I'm 53 years old, and I get a question a lot about regrets. I don't have a lot. I've learned a lot. I've been through a lot of ups and downs. Um, I never looked at the valuation of my business as being that important until, I, and I wish I'd done it 15 years earlier. So Let's talk about that. So revenue is just how much business your business does, obviously, how much how much actual business dollar wise. Profit is what's left. Valuation is in my so most entrepreneurs are are focused on profit, hopefully. A lot are focused on revenue, which can be good, but it's not going to make you any money. Uh, you know, you've heard this, they, they heard the great the great quote, uh, revenue is vanity, profit sanity, and and cash is king. But the one thing that's always left out is valuation. So for us, if you're trying to make money, you need to be making profit. Valuation is how much your business is worth. And it's a sleeping thing that this is actually how most entrepreneurs become wealthy. It's not generally from creating a business that throws off a, a lot of cash. Uh, most people you've met have been very successful. It's because they may have generated a lot of cash while they're running their company, but many of them have had exits that have made them uh, very wealthy. So what I learned in a lot of small businesses is because they're trying to get profitable, they often just don't think about what's the valuation of my business because that's your sleeping third way of making money. 
So usually the valuation of your business, how much your business is actually worth, is some multiple of how much profit you do or how much revenue you do. And every business has a, a, a theory. Uh, if you want to know what yours is, just email us and we can kind of give you a basic, a basic best guess on it. But I tell people, you got to keep that in mind because not only are you trying to make yourself your 100 grand, 500 grand, a million dollars a year for profit, I tell them, you got to make sure you're growing the value of your business. And we have a lot of clients who don't think about that. And then they end up exiting for a large amount of money. Uh, and they say, how did I even do that? Or they don't exit for enough money at all. And they say, I wish I'd been more strategic in my thinking around that. So one of our things, one of our kind of crusades as a company is to help people understand, we want you to be profitable. We want you to grow your revenue, but we also want you to ask yourself the question, am I building the, the business that has the most value it possibly can? Because that ultimately might be one of your biggest home runs you get. Yeah, let, let, me, let me just dig in a little bit more on this because this is, this is a really important conceptual leak. You can, you become, right. yeah. you can become more, you can, okay. So profit is essentially owner benefit. Uh, you know, for most businesses, uh, profit's what you get to pay yourself. And yeah. I can tell you on a personal level that for the first six years I ran my business, I made a really bad salary, worse than anything I've made in my entire career. I was making less money in my uh, 40s than I was making in my early 20s. The way I've actually been able to give myself a decent salary this year, thank goodness, is because we are profitable. And yeah. so the other thing is when you're a pass-through entity, like an LLC or an S Corp, you know, when you're, you know, you get taxed for profit and it doesn't actually matter if it's in your company bank account or your personal bank account. Like my accountant says, it doesn't matter. You can take the money that's in the company bank account, shift it to your personal bank account, it has no tax implication. You've already paid taxes on it, which is yeah. to say profit for small companies like most of us is, is essentially your salary. Um, or what you could potentially pay yourself. Now, you obviously want to set, set aside money for taxes and set aside money for R&D and set aside money so that you don't run out of cash. So you don't want to give it all to yourself. But that's what the Profit First book is about, is say, like, what kind of take home do I want? Start with that number and then work backwards financially to get there. But here's the thing. Things that you could do to increase your profitability today, like avoiding taxes, could actually hurt your valuation. That's right. And so, you know... We all want to avoid paying taxes, and a lot of us make really stupid decisions that allow us to make more profit today and hurt our company in the long run. Because any potential buyer that looks at the shenanigans some of you are pulling in your businesses are going to say, this isn't a company I'm willing to invest in. Right. So there's a million decisions like that where they're, they're, it's like, it's like short-termism. You know, are you, are you going to sacrifice the short-term profitability of your company for its long-term value? Well, it depends on your goal. If your goal is to live in a company that is essentially a job that pays you a salary, then maximize profit. But if you're interested in selling this company and having you know, generational wealth and an exit, then you're really trying to build a company that's sellable. And that is, a, that is where valuation becomes more important. You got it. And our goal is to, our goal is to get you to be intentional around that conversation. So we have years in the companies that we own and the companies we work with where people will say, I want to make X amount of dollars. And one of our big questions is, how does that affect our five or 10 year plan of what we're trying to do? <clears throat> Are we trying to exit? Are we trying to create long term wealth? <clears throat> what is our play and how does this year play into that? But I didn't ask myself those questions until I was probably 35 years old as a business person. Nobody ever told me that. I was just trying yeah. to make as much money as possible. And and let me let me make put this again on a personal level. I'm I'm gonna just try to be the guy who explains this in like human terms. So with my company, for the first five years that I ran it, my wife was the CEO of a nonprofit and she was the breadwinner. And I just plowed every single extra cent into growing the company. And you know, COVID happened and sometimes it was more about survival than growth, but my wife left the, her CEO job to become an independent consultant in March, and we want to buy a house. So the, what I like to say is BizHack finally has to pay. It can, it can no longer live rent-free in the Gretsch household. <laughs> 
So I said, this is a year. Also, you married well. You can also say that. Dude, anyone who knows my wife knows I married up in a big way. Um, <laughs> so, so profit maximization was the number one goal of the year. And I have been running so lean as a result. I, I actually have a little sticker here that I will look at every day. We talked about neur 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 neural programming last week. It yeah. says harvest, harvest. I've spent six years planting seeds. This was the year that I harvested them. That's awesome. That's awesome. <clears throat> so Dan, what, what, uh, it's funny. And I was telling you this and you and I, you know, you and I can and do talk for hours on, on any, any topic, but what's interesting is when we go and work, we work with 130 firms. We go and dive in and work with any firm and we, we don't, we care about money because it's a, it's a scorecard. Okay. We, we care mostly that businesses are increasing revenue, profit, and valuation while they're changing the world or doing whatever it is they care about. That's what we care about. But when we go and work with a firm, we get them cleaned up, all this kind of stuff. It always comes down to the same question, no matter how much they do or don't care about money, they always end up in the same place, which is, I want this firm to be financially successful. Always. It's never, it's never not the case. And I work with people that I, I they tell me we don't care about money, but in the end, they say, you are correct. We are now running a great firm. We want to make sure this firm is winning the scorecard financially. And that's all we're trying to do. Learn what that scorecard looks like and give yourself the most benefit. Should you keep going? I'm going to keep diving in. No, this is perfect. I'm, we're ready for your next lesson. All right. So now we have our, our mind framed on where we're going. And I'm going to go through the next slides relatively quickly because Dan and I will go for hours here. We do use OKRs as our goal setting system. You might use rocks or hots or whatever else you're using. We use objectives and key results. Don't get overwhelmed in that. It's just a goal setting system that we use. We are also big believers in using a scorecard. But we're here to talk about today is the financial side of measuring this and how it links to those things. And that's through budget and forecast. So that's what we're going to focus on today. And on that note, and this is, is something that um, uh, it, it's very difficult to dispute, especially when you really fine tune your team. And this is kind of where Dan is in his life. And the question is, what is the actual main job of a senior leadership team? Um, and it's people get tripped on this. And when we start working with firms, the owner doesn't know the answer. Senior leadership teams don't know the answer. And the answer actually is certainly in our opinion to ensure that the company hits its profit and cash flow targets. That is the goal of a senior leadership team. Now you might think, well, yeah, but we're focusing on, on, on providing education. We're focusing on changing the world through AI. No question. But if you don't focus on making sure you hit your, your profit and cash flow targets as a senior leadership team, you will not be able to accomplish what you, your company uh, wants to accomplish. And why is that? Here's why. Profit's one of the truest indicators of health for a company, number one. Is the company healthy? What should the business be making? And actually, is it doing that? Cash gives you the fuel to achieve your mission. So if you're funded, that's why people that are funded, it looks like they're having an easier job of it. Sometimes it looks like that because they have cash. Three is it allows you to reward and incentivize your team members. We make we focus on making money for companies and oftentimes the team members get a chunk, a big chunk of that back. Because it's not like we're all just trying to make money, money, money. It's about just being running a healthy company and making sure our team is also well rewarded. Profit and cash give you peace of mind, per Dan's comments earlier, as an owner and a leadership team. Anytime I work with a company, the only reason the owner, the owner or the leadership team does not have peace in mind is usually financial or because of internal fighting around the model or just internal angst. But finances end up being a huge source of strain and they don't usually need to be. And then lastly, profit and revenue ultimately whether you're going to sell your business or give it to your kids later, ultimately the way the market values your business is directly on the profit and revenue of your firm. That's what it values your company on. Uh, and so you got to make sure you're conscious of that. So profit and cash give you peace of mind. They give you the ability to run your company strong and accomplish all the things you want to do with your business 
uh, to change the world, change your own life, et cetera. So I want to go back for a sec, because I cannot talk to you about how profound this slide is and how important it is for you guys to really absorb it. So I'd like to pause on it for a sec because we're going to be spending some time in some pretty technical tools, but we need you to understand why this matters to help hook you into what he's about to say. Um, Cause it's, it is a little intimidating to look at some of these spreadsheets, but, but a couple of things. Number one, when you're a for-profit company, profitability is a proxy for meeting the market's needs. In other words, when you are making money as a company, it means that you're meeting the needs of your clients. It's the only way you'll survive. You, you, you know, otherwise, what, what are you doing? Stealing from them, you know, forcing them to do things they don't want to? That doesn't work in this economy. You, your profitability, I mean, your revenue is this, the, the single uh, best measure that people want what you want, but profitability is the sustainability of it. Because the bottom line is, if you don't get people buying- That's a great way to say it, by the way. That's a great way to say it. Revenue is how much does the market want you? Profit is, are you running a healthy company now that the market wants you? Exactly. And and by the way, you can be profitable. Uh, you can be have a lot of revenue and not be profitable. And that will end in the destruction of the company and the value you're providing will go away. Because most of us are small businesses. We don't have the luxury of being funded by VCs who can allow us like Amazon to lose money for 10, 15 years. Like most of us do need to make some kind of money. When you're not making money in your business, that's when the chirping starts, both your own chirping and all the people in your life who need you to be making money in order to support them. And that's so what ends up happening is it erodes your enjoyment. It stops you from like actually... Like it's very hard to find meaning in work that's impoverishing you. And so what ends up happening is purpose-driven businesses um, can only last for so long if they're not also profitable. So I would think about profitability in two ways. One is it's a sustainability tactic. I can tell you my mood is so much better when my company is profitable than when I'm losing money. In fact, I'll go one step further. I don't know if I've ever had worse moments professionally than when my company was losing money month over month. And if any of you have ever been in a position where you couldn't make payroll, it's the most gutting, horrendous feeling in, in history. I mean, at that point, it's not just your own family whose mouths can't get fed. It's your, it's your people's. And they've committed to you. They're in the trenches with you. Your one job was to pay them on time and you can't do it. Or you have to like borrow from a vendor or, or find emergency financing to make payroll. It is the most horrendous, destructive, you know, soul crushing feeling. So like make it your job to never have to deal with it. That's why profitability and cash flow is your only job. That's because, correct. Because if you are doing good in the world and meeting a need, you will become profitable. Uh, and you're running an efficient business, you will be profitable. You will have revenue, and then and then if you run it well, you'll be profitable. So in other words, the purpose of running a business is not to make money, in my opinion. It's to solve problems in the world. But the best measure of whether you're solving problems in the world are revenue and profitability and cash flow. That's correct. And you'll see our kind of our quote at the end ties that up, because I, I agree with you. So- I'm about to go into some of these tools and there's only a few of them. And I, I'm going to reiterate because of what, especially because what Dan just said, I'm an entrepreneur. I've owned a bunch of businesses in my life, but the reason I got smart at this is because I lost millions of dollars. I stress payroll many times, Dan, you don't even know all these stories. So I stress payroll many times and it's because I couldn't track all the dots I grew big companies and then couldn't, I didn't know, I didn't have financial training. So I couldn't track all the dots to what I was doing. And I had a lot of cash and I didn't understand where the profit was. And I got myself into trouble. And then I learned, I will never do that again. And I'm going to help as many people as I can to make sure that not only do they not get into this kind of problems that I have, but to make sure that they can maximize uh, their dollars as well. All right. So let's dive in. So this is just one of our clients. Uh, if Steve was here, he is the the poacher child for all this. Uh, he is also a person that's trying to change the world in his business and is now doing that. Uh, his quote, I realized if we're going to scale the business the way we wanted to, we had to become masters of our money. Uh, this is a healthcare communications company, longtime entrepreneurs organization member. 
he was desperately trying to scale his business and couldn't largely because his finances were not in great shape. Now he's, he's killing it, as you're going to see in a minute. But let's dive into the tools that we use. Now, we built a company, we built an avatar company here to really track it top down to bottom. The company we, we created here is called TechWise Solutions. Now, to be clear, we only changed the name, honestly, and a couple of the things. This is actually a regular company that we work with with a few tweaks to protect the innocent. Like this is a real company though. So some of this you can just ignore except for the stuff that we have in red. You can see we do use, uh, we have a tool called the Growth Roadmap. And this shows you, like Dan said, the stuff up top is actually what we care probably the most about, which is the core values of our company, the mission of our company, the niche of our company, the target market, the value proposition, which links to revenue, which is a long, not, whole other webinar in itself and then the ways you earn money. But if you go to this, firm, to this, so we start with this kind of roadmap. If you're using any of the systems, whether the growth method or EOS or whatever it is, you're gonna have something like this. But the, where this starts financially is right here in this North Star box. So you see the change of the world statement here is this company wants to be the go-to firm for revenue operations by 2031. This, that's what they're trying to do. They want to be the go-to firm for RevOps. Let's call the geography of the United States. So that statement is helpful for me when I go work with them. That's helpful for me to say, these, this team wants to be it. Okay, that's framing. But now I gotta get, get more, I gotta get more granular to help them to actually start to put their arms around this. So we break it into chunks. We just break, and you can do this easily on your own, whatever your targets are. In this case, we said 45 million revenue having 100 consultants working in the field, and 50% of their revenue is their managed services. You can insert whatever your own bullets are into this, but the bottom line is they say, we want to change the world in revenue operations, and we want to get to $45 million by 2031. Okay, now I have something to hang my planning on, and it's going to root everything I do. Now, remember, I have all this stuff up top too, but this is a financial webinar, but I just wanted you all to understand like core values, all that stuff, like a big believer in that, just to be clear. But this is the finance side. So I'll keep going. So now I got my $45 million. Once I get that, and now I got a vision. Okay, my company's large. I got 400 employees. I'm doing $45 million. I'm taking over RevOps. The next place you want to break that down is three years. Now, the reason that our system and other systems go with three years is that three years is long enough that it's still a vision, but it's short enough that you can still try and get things done against it. So it's not too big and it's not too small. The firms we work with, we're generally working to hit their three-year objectives. That's usually our plan. Now, in this company's case, you can see on the finance side of it, they're trying to get to $15 million in revenue in three years. They're trying to get their cost of services, which is just how much they're spending on their product. So this is they take 15 million in and they can spend 9 million of it on delivering the product. That gives them a $6 million gross profit. Now this is a finance tools webinar, but I will say this, this is big. If you get nothing out of this else as, as webinar, everybody thinks the way to make money is to cut expenses. Yes, that's valuable. It's helpful if that's important, if that's what you need to do. The number one killer of, of, of businesses in terms of finance is their inability to know their gross margin, their gross profit, and their inability to get as much growth, gross profit out of the business as they're supposed to get in their industry. Gross profit is the killer. So once again, if I'm selling, um, if I'm selling a, a recruiting service, my gross profit is how much money I have left over after I pay my recruiters. That's gross profit. The companies need to maximize that. Stat length, their biggest issue was their gross profit was actually 20% less than it had to be in the market. And they could not grow their company because of that. So in this company's case, they're trying to get 40% revenue. They're trying to get $4.5 million of operating expenses. In this case, it's management and marketing. That This is them spending money out, out of their gross profit. And in this company's case, in three years, they said, if we can have $1.5 million in pre-tax profit after we do all those things, we're in great shape. Now I have a model. Now I have a model and I can link my planning around that and work backwards. So here's how we do that. We then go into the one year. 
one year is basically a to-do list. People think that one year is far away. It's not. It's basically a to-do list for a company. So in this company's case, we brought that down into needing to do $6.9 million in revenue, close $2.4 million in new annual recurring revenue, sign up. I put these under finance and hitting our numbers because these things are all what drives the financial plan. 20 new logos, 90 new sales qualified leads, 95% retention, 40% professional services, gross margin, and 50, 50 NPS from end service. You can leave the NPS part of it out. But you can see in this company's case, to do $6.9 million in revenue, they have to do these things. Now, back to Dan's point. Money, I don't want to give away my end quote. Money is not the be all end all of what we're trying to do. But if we're trying to do everything else on that roadmap, I have to do these things or I can't become the leader in my RevOps space. I've just now broken that down into what does that require financially for me to achieve that? So then I keep going down one more time and I get into the quarter. And then in the quarter, we're now down to 500,000 new managed services, 700,000 new managed services ARR. $1.2 million. You can see all this 95% retention, 40% gross margin, 1.5 million for the target for the quarter. But really the only reason I care about the 90 day target is because I'm trying to take over RevOps and grow a $45 million company. And this 90 day plan is going to get me to that. And my numbers are all tied in. So I just wanted you to see this part of it because I don't yeah. want you to think if I get the financial tools in place, I'm in great shape. So G Golda Nana uh, Boyaki uh, had a really wonderful question. Oh, we lost you, Dan. Lost your audio for a second. You're, you're on mute. Yeah. Sure. Um, the, Golda Nana uh, uh, Boyaki had a really wonderful question about benchmarking against the market. Um, and how do you know if the profitability uh, and revenue and margin targets. Um, how do you know how that compares with other folks in your industry? Golda, you're a freaking genius. That's a great question. I hope everybody else benefits from this question because that's a great one. Um, I have a slide on this coming up in a minute, but I'm going to give you the answer on this. So uh, you got to do again. You got to dig in, and do research. That is a genius question. So one of the first things we do when we work with a company is we start to ask, "What are your competitors earning?" We need to come up with a financial model. We're going to look at competitors, mainly competitors. We're going to dig around the internet, believe it or not. You'd be shocked at what you can find by it. I'm not sure what industry you're in, but you'd be shocked by what you can find out for the gross margin, the net profit in your industry. You can do that. You'd also be shocked by, by what your competitors will tell you if you ask them. You'd be shocked. Shocked. I'm extremely close to all my competitors. We have conversations even via text where I say, I'm heading this way right now. What are you seeing? Like, what are you seeing for a margin? Am I way off or what am I? And you'd be shocked because people have egos. So they want to help you. People want to help and they're caring, good people. I answer all questions that are asked. It's one of our policies. If any of our competitors ask a question, we give an answer. That's the way it is. You are asking one of the most key questions you can get out of this webinar, which is what should my financial model be? I would research through your competitors, the internet and everything else. That's how I do it. All right, and we're going to show you that in a second. So now I know where I'm going financially, and I'm drilled down to what I need to do the next 90 days, and I see how that ties to my bigger picture. Let's dive into just the finance function and what this looks like. I'm going to say it again. It might look, Dan likes to tell me, Dan says, Eric, you're glazing everybody's eyes over. I don't like this stuff either. Trust me, I'm not a finance person, okay? I am an entrepreneur. I'm just one that lost a fortune and then got sick of doing it. So a well-built out finance function will help you achieve your revenue, profit, and valuation targets over the next three years and beyond. Okay, well, that's great. Let's talk about how to do it. Now, Dan, I swear if you have me back, I will turn this into bullets. I know this is too many words. Go ahead and complain. I already know you're complaining. Financial model. This is tool number one. Okay, there's only, I think there's only four of these tools. One, two, three, four. Okay, now, there you go, a little preview. There are only four financial tools that we actually use. And I'm going to tell you, if you're under about 75 million bucks, this will do it for you. Now, we have some of the best CFOs, uh, not to brag, but they are, that I've ever worked with on our in our finance company. They are phenomenal. And they fight with me all the time. And some of them are on this call. Uh, they are freaking smart, and I love them. And they're always like, Eric, there's more to it. 
yes, there is more to it than the four tools I'm going to show you. And those people are always right and way smarter than me. But as an entrepreneur, I want you to understand that there are four things that are table stakes. And if you get them right, you will be fine up to a very substantial revenue number. If you start getting over 75 to 100, we have clients that are much bigger than that. You're going to need some more robust, maybe even 50 million. You're going to need some more robust stuff. Under 50 million bucks, you're good to go with the following things. Number one is a financial model. This is the, the question that Golda just asked. A financial model is, I'm going to show it to you in a minute. It's what should my spending and my revenue and my income look like? What does the industry look like? Where am I currently? And what is my actual business model? Okay. So I don't want to overexplain this, but I'll think back to stat links. It took me about a year to realize I believe this business is heavily under on gross margin and therefore unfixable because the model is broken. Time to do some research. So that's financial model. That's tool number one. Tool number two, a three-year financial plan that also includes a one-year budget and also includes cash flow. Now, you might think, Eric, this is so freaking difficult. I'm going to show it to you. We're going to give you all the templates you want. We have Help First is one of our core values. We will literally help you with this stuff for a couple hours and help you dive into it. No problem. Won't cost you anything. Finance team's going to freak out now. But that's the truth. We will. But you need a three-year, one financial plan. I'm going to show you. A one-year budget. And you need to have a cash plan. How did I lose millions of dollars? I had no idea what my cash plan was that linked and I was screwed. I just didn't have it. I, I have it now and I'll show you what it looks like, but I didn't for many years of my business. You need to do a monthly review. Okay. As Dan says, this is eating your broccoli, but this is really good broccoli. This is the kind with cheese on it. This is the kind that makes you money. You have to do some kind of monthly review if you're sitting there right now, which I'm betting you a third of you are, and you're saying, I'm not where I want to be financially and I can't figure out why, I'm going to show you how to fix that just by doing one meeting a month. And then lastly, this is a tool that my genius controller, who I absolutely love, we have a commercial painting company we own. And I'm going to give him all credit for it. He came out of a very large firm and he brought this forecasting tool with him and, I, and is still to this day, one of the best forecasting tools I've ever seen. Now, I'm going to show you what each of these four things are in a minute. We're going to give you the ability to take these things with you. You do these four things, your finances will be managed and you will know where your gaps are. So let's dive in. Number one, back to Golda's question. You must have this, okay? You've got to figure out where it is you're trying to go with your targets first. So you'll see we build a model on the left-hand side uh, and we see the categories, net profit, uh, research and development, uh, administration, cost of goods sold, that's how much it's costing you to build your widgets, and then uh, sales and marketing, okay? So in the industry standard, back to her question, I got this through calling competitors, doing research, joining trade groups, and understanding this is the model, this is the industry standard, most of it's online, this is where I need to be. Now, here's where you get tripped up in this. You say, yeah, that's the industry standard, but uh, yeah, 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 our target's this. And my answer is usually, if the industry standard's this and you think it's 10% less, you might as well not even get up. Like you can't, you can't solve that problem. If you miss any of these standards and you forecast them wrong and you don't get this model right, you will literally be pushing a rock uphill, okay? So you got to nail this. In this company's case, TechWise Solutions, this is a real case scenario. They are at 15% um, uh, for sales and marketing, 15% for cost of goods sold, 10% on research and development. Their net profit came in at 15% and their cost of goods at 45%. Their cost of goods is great. I'll show you how we do this analysis in a minute. Their cost of goods is, is really strong. Their admin costs are a little high. Their net profit is uh, very good, very strong. Notice, by the way, that their net profit is 5% higher than their forecast. We would say likely it's because of the 5% uptick in their gross margin. So this company is spending less money to produce widgets. Once again, if you want to really increase your finances, spend less to do to, to, to increase your gross margin. One caveat, as Dan mentioned earlier, sometimes if your gross margin is too high, uh, we'll dive in and say, I'm not sure you're paying your workers enough. Uh, it's possible that you're you're squeezing too much out. And that often, as Dan's words, are becomes unsustainable. So 
we kind of believe it or not like you to be around the model within about a 5% variation. If you have some secret sauce and you can beat it by 10%, great. But if it's really crazy profit margin, usually I look at it and I'm like, I think you squeezing too much out of this lemon and uh, you're not going to be able to scale your business if you don't spending start spending where you need to spend. Bottom line is you need a financial model. It's just this simple. Questions, email us. We'll give you the plan. Now, all right, Dan, go ahead. Go ahead, Dan. Dan loves Ouch. this. Dan. Ouch. This is Dan's favorite slide. When Dan saw this slide as a marketer, he said, this is going to get you millions of hits on Google just because you put this on there. Now, this slide from looking at it, and I, I don't like to include this, but when I don't include the slide, everybody emails me, literally everybody, and says, can you give me a slide that shows me what that thing looks like? I know it's painful. Okay, here's all I want you to get out of this word, word vomit, this number vomit here. This is all I want you to get out of it. You have a 12 month budget for the year. It ends up being your fiscal year 23. It shows you all your expenses and it shows you how much money you're going to make. Where does this stuff up top come from? It comes from your three year planning and your one year planning sessions or, or just your thinking on a piece of note paper, if that's all you're doing. You got to plan in all your expenses. I like you to usually do it in November. I call it the bank numbers. I always pretend we have a bank. We don't have a big credit line in any of our companies. I've learned that lesson. Nothing wrong with credit lines, by the way, but I've had too much. But I still pretend we do. So I call the budget the bank numbers. What would we go to the bank and say, that's what we're going to hit? because this is ultimately how I'm feeding my family and paying my mortgage. So I try and be conservative, yet not too conservative. And in this case, the, the fiscal year 23 right here, this is the budget. I now, this is very important. Once you get your budget dialed in for the year, now this may take you time. This can take six months, nine months. And if you don't get this for a year, that's okay. You need to start thinking, what, do, what does year two and three look like? And the reason that matters so much is that if you just keep trying to hit your one-year plan, even if you always do, you likely will not grow like you want to grow. And I know that sounds odd, but the definition of a successful year is that you hit your financial targets for the year but you're also pacing towards the next year after that, and even two years. I love having the two years outside built also. These are usually built by quarter. I get that question a lot, how detailed is it? It's by quarter usually in years two and three, not that detailed. It also gives me vision and excitement and it allows me to gamify it. So I can look at this and say, this year we're gonna do 600 grand, we're gonna do 1.5 in two years, I'm gonna be able to hire the staff I want and I now see how I'm going to be able to do it. And then what does the bottom of this show me? It just shows me cash. Here's how much this generates for me every month on a cash basis. Here's how much cash I will have. Now you can sleep at night. I hate the expression cash is king. I hate it. And every finance person yells at me about this. The reason I hate it is because you could have a gazillion dollars in the bank and be totally screwed. I've done it before, it's no good. However, the sentiment that cash is king is a good one, the sentiment, because you have to have enough cash to grow your business. And what this is showing you is if you do these things up top, you will have this much cash left at the end of each month. And what that tells you is, do I need funding? If so, by when? And am I going to be okay financially? If anybody had just done this with me, it literally would have saved me 10 to 15 years of my business life, but they didn't. So. Yeah, I want to, I want to comment on this. So every business has periods uh, of time when you're going to lose money month over month. Um, a great example is when you invest in maybe a new hire um, and it takes a little while to onboard them or, um, you know, you are, hired by someone to do a project, but you're getting paid on a net 90 or net 120 terms or upon completion. So you're basically investing all this in the delivery of something and then the payoff might come a whole quarter later. 
there are all sorts of reasons why you're going to be in positions where you're losing money in a given month or even a given quarter. What's so important is that you have to understand what happens over the course of the rolling 12 uh, or over the course of the remainder of the year so that you don't freak out when you see your bank account dwindling. You're like, I knew this was coming. I'm, I'm prepared for it. And I know, I know that this will pass. And so, you know, for instance, in my business this year, um, we had a really tight cash period over the summer. And part of it was because, you know, as an academy, we don't do a lot of training over the summer. Yeah. And so I saw my bank account dwindling month after month, and I was fine with it because I knew that there was a cash infusion coming. Um, and I had it mapped out. And, the, and, and then the other thing, of course, is if you know you're about to go to a skinny period, um, you know, you spend less. So this the, the analogy here is very clear. You know, if you get paid every two weeks or every month, right? How do you, how are you feeling those last couple of days before the start of your next, before you get paid, right? You, you're, you're tight. And you do things like all the time people uh, sign up my courses and they say, hey, do you mind if I, if you process my card on Friday, that's when I get paid. Yeah. It's just the same idea, but at a larger level, uh, you're dealing with a business rather than an individual. But the concept is the same, which is you have a lot of tactics that you can use to slow pay vendors. And if you have good relationships with vendors, you know, for me, I don't mind taking your credit card information and processing it in five days. No big deal. Um, you know, a lot of your vendors, you know, will tell you, hey, no worries. We'll give you we'll give you um, like, in, you know, interest free, uh, you know, financing for an extra week uh, just to allow you to have your cash lined up. By the way, one other little tidbit on this is if you ever do find yourself in a position where you can't make payroll, um, one of the first places you can go are your vendors and you can ask, can I slow pay you? Right. Can I delay payment? I'm good for it. We've been in, and that's why having good relationships with vendors and paying on time when you can is so important because it builds up the ability for you to slow pay them when you really need it. Yes. Beautiful. So what Dan is going through and telling you, and he's a, you know, long time entrepreneur, he's telling you the tactics that you now need to do depending on where you are and what this shows you. So for what I'm trying to show you is how do we best predict where we're going and where that might happen? And I'm gonna show you how to do the forecast that Dan is alluding to in a minute, because that's important also. So for me, if, if I'm working with Dan, I'm gonna say, Dan, here's where we're gonna be by the revenue, by the numbers. If we end up going into a slow period, it's going to look like this. And I want to know that in advance, especially if Dan is investing in his business, which happens a lot. So we work with companies that are, most of them are trying to scale their companies. And they're not all huge either. We work with companies that are a million, $2 million. Uh, so we work with these companies that are trying to scale. So what happens is Dan goes from lean in the summer to how was I? How did I go from lean and having no money to lean and make it a fifty grand? And how that happens in some cases because Dan decides he wants to invest in his business, which is which is not necessarily bad. So the reason we plan all this out in advance is because we want you to see if you're going to invest in your business, how does that affect you and when? Because you want to have that ability to invest in your business. Now I want to say this, and then we'll move to the next one. The only two tools left. I like leaving this up here, though, because I know Dan likes it. It's one of the reasons I like this slide so much. But last thing, the reason that AI, the reason this is so much more exciting than AI, because I know it is, is not only is this a great way to predict your finances and put you in control, and this is what matters most to me, honestly, because I hate this stuff, honestly. But the reason I like this tool so much is uh, that it gives me vision. So I can see the future. I can stay excited. I can say, wow, 24 looks awesome if I can just do this. 25 looks even better. And my margins start to go up because my business is growing. I like finance tools like this because they provide you with vision. That's why I like them. You know, okay. I, I took down your slide because um, there was a typo in December 2023. I think that number should be 127,000. 312. I knew that's what you were doing. 
Yeah. I knew you were trying to calculate that out. <laughs> oh, man. Well, uh, share away. Sorry. I just, uh, it was more of a joke than anything. It's too, it's too much for you, Dan. You probably hit your limit. I can't believe no, it. No, my brain is fully exploded at slide yeah, 43. Done. I'm getting you out of here, Dan. I'm throwing the ripcord. I'm going to go Thank to other you, slides you're not going to like. But Thank this is the worst one you're going to hate, though. So that's the good news. It's all downhill from here. Very merciful. So now we have this thing. We have a planning tool. Now we get into much simpler stuff, honestly. Now, believe it or not, we eat our own dog food in my companies because we didn't used to have that dog food. I just did this this morning with our finance company and our consulting company. It is this simple. Now, this is a perfect example of what Dan said earlier. This truly is going to the gym, and it is your broccoli. But if you want to look this amazing, you got to eat broccoli and go to the gym. All right? So what does that look like financially? It's as simple as this. We print out, because you don't need us to do any of this stuff. You can do all this on your own. We can give you some templates if you need it. You print out the QuickBooks for this month. You put it, you just, just top to bottom. What, what did we spend on, on, on expenses? What was our gross margin? What was our revenue? And then right next to it, you put, you print out what it was supposed to be. And then to the right of that, where did we get it right? And where do we get it wrong? You do that every month. You will prevent long-term losses you will prevent long-term lack of pattern recognition for what's working, and you will be able to tweak on the fly monthly and feel way more in control of your finances. So when we go and work with a company that may be losing cash or not making as much as they want, this is the very first thing we do. And within two to three months, the owners, not us, the leadership team says, Okay, well, it's becoming pretty obvious where we spend 15% too much money, and it's becoming very obvious that we are not making enough gross margin, so now let's fix these things, and then you just look at it every month. The meeting takes one hour. This morning, we finished two companies in one hour, and the first one was literally done within 30 minutes. I'd actually show you ours, but my chief revenue officer always yells at me when I do that and says, please stop sharing all of our financials. So I won't, but it looks exactly like this. This is what it looks like. And we have some misses this month in our company. We have some overspend areas. We have a couple of revenue misses. Uh, and we sit and we contemplate. What did we get right? What did we get wrong? What is the business telling us? Close the month, move on, look at the future. Exciting stuff. You do this, you will. If you do just this one tool, and you don't even budget, your business finances will get on track and likely you'll be achieving the margins you want just by this one stupid tool. Now, then let me show you how the last thing, this is the last chart. Dan, this is half the size. Half. Wait, wait, wait. I, I got I to gotta interrupt you. I got a private message so you didn't see it, but it's, um. so it's, uh, I do business consulting, my, consulting myself and I've met and heard many other business financial advisors. Eric is by far the most knowledgeable business advisor I have heard. Thank you for this masterclass. And he still has one more tool to go. Whoever said that, I got more charts coming too. This is, thank you very much. I'm humbled. Uh, I'm going to tell you again, because you said that very nice thing. Um, yeah, her, her name is Myra Rocha. She's a good friend of BizHacks, uh, instructor uh, and, and, also, that's, and that's also a business coach. But um Yes, it's Myra, this is exactly why I selected him, because he can speak uh, so beautifully as an entrepreneur to financials. And I'm really grateful to you, Eric, for the time you put into this. I, I appreciate that. And I'm glad Myra said that, because what I want you to understand, and I say this, um, and you guys, some of you met Mark, if you met, if you met Mark Moses, my coach, uh, Mark and I, um, as business coaches, are not that smart. And it's the truth. We are not that smart. And in fact, Mark and I have both blown it royally in business, royally. Mark and I could tell you horror stories that would make you say, I don't want to be an entrepreneur anymore, like that bad. But in this process of those horror stories, what we realized is we just forgot something. And a business is a lemonade stand. You get the, in the best business people I know, and this is why Mark and I have actually gotten a lot smarter because we've gotten a lot dumber. The best business people I know are the dumbest ones. And they're like, wait a second, you gave me a hundred bucks for my glass of lemonade. 
and I can only spend $10 on sugar. I can only spend this much on the cups and that left me 90 bucks. And then I got to pay this other kid. I'm going to try and pay him as little as possible so I can go buy a skateboard. That is a genius business person. Somewhere we forget that because we could lose it in the charts. We lose it in the numbers and we forget no matter how big your company is, you're just running a big lemonade stand. And the goal is to spend as little money on cups and sugar as you can and to give your helper as little as possible without, without cheating them and still being an amazing employer. And that gives you profit. That's all a business is. So you remember that, you're in good shape. So now I'm going to take this monthly meeting and I'm going to go into this tool that I always give my controller credit for because he friggin' nailed it. It was the smartest thing. Charles is not here because uh, he hates listening about this crap. But, and he's always he's already got it. He introduced me this tool called the six and six or the one and 11 or the two and the 10. So what do those numbers mean? This tool finally made finance fun for me. And he just sent it to me one day randomly. And here's what the numbers mean. If we finish January, for example, January's finished. I've actually closed January. Now for the record, that's something else I didn't do for 15 years is actually close my books. I know that sounds crazy, but except probably to some of you, it doesn't. But to me, it was great. I never did it. But you have to kind of close your books. So I know if you're not doing that, you're like, hey, I'll get to it. No, close your books. Once you close your books, if, if I look at this in January, I get this every month from my financial team. If it's January sending it to me, it's called a one and 11. So in January, just January is shaded. And that's because the month is closed. So it's called a one and 11. In January, it's called a one and 11 because one month is done. So that you got what you got. That's how you performed. But you got 11 months left. And if you hit the following numbers, it gives you an end number. It turns it into a game. Now, I'm not that smart. So I'm like, I can play a game. I understand that. So in this particular example, this is called the six and six. So a six and six just means I got it in June. If I got it in May, it'd be the five and the seven. So the six and six, now I know that so far for the year, this is where I stand. And I believe this one does actually, usually they have, I don't think this one has totals on it. Does it? Usually they have totals. This Oh, it does. To, does. Okay. So there's a totals at the bottom and it's telling me that so far for the year, <laughs> oh, it doesn't add them up. That's the issue. Doesn't have a, does have a, nope, doesn't have a summary column. Okay. It's supposed to have a summary column. Sorry, my mistake. So usually as a summary column, in this case, I can add it up. I can tell you it's, we, so far this company's made 57, 55, 53, 51. This company's made 51 grand for the year so far on revenue. Uh, you can do the math, 1.5, 1.9, 2.3, 2.7. Okay, so this company has issues. I will tell you this, okay? They made 53 grand on two point whatever of business. However, now you would argue in this case, they probably won't hit the remaining numbers. But if they do, they will end up over here on the right. So, so far this year, I've made myself 60 grand. I've done 2.3 million. That is the game. That's where I am, but I got six months left to change that game. So every month I get to know where am I in the innings of the baseball game? How many innings do I have left? And what do I need to do to improve my circumstance? And it allows me to gamify my year. Most genius financial tool I've ever seen. And it speaks to me as an entrepreneur. It gives me hope and it also keeps me honest. And uh, I get equal parts both from my numbers because I'm human and my numbers sometimes look great. Sometimes they don't. So when they don't, it looks like, okay, well, we this year is what it is. What can we do to salvage part of it? Or do we not want to salvage part of it? But either way, not only do I know where I am for the year so far, so I have certainty, I have hope and a plan for the future. And this stupid tool does it. And all it is, is your... QuickBooks finalized with your forecast tacked onto it. That's it. Simple as can be. You want to help putting one together? Send us an email. We'll do it for you. Pretty quick, short stuff. Now, I'm going to go back to this slide real quick. And I'm going to say it again. That's it. You need those four things. That's it. it and it's literally not more than that. And the only one that's a little complex is your three-year financial plan. But your three financial plan already includes the one year and just stick the cash flow plan at the bottom. You do these four things, you are good to go. You are good to quick, go. Quick question on the six plus six. 
Um, is it rolling six? So like you look at the, if it's like February, you would look at the previous six months and the next six months, or is it- Great question. A calendar year. It's a great question. I keep a count. I keep a calendar year or fiscal year. I keep a calendar year. When I start getting towards the last three months, I tend to say, let's pop another 12 onto the end so I can look forward another 12 months. I, I believe budgeting season should be October to December with December really being the tail end. I don't care if you're 500 grand, you should have your budget done by October, November, December, thinking about next year already. So for me, once it gets into October, November, December, my budget for next year is already done, uh, which it is, I think, as of today, actually. Uh, I can see it looking forward. So the answer, Dan, is I'm looking at a calendar year, but I have visibility into the next year, usually three or four months prior to the when it starts. Okay. So I'm telling you, that's it. It's those four tools. Everybody's trying to trip me up. Every genius CFO I've got working for me. You get those things done. You're in great shape. There's other stuff as well. And my CFOs were talking right now. They would tell you there's a thousand things they do that are genius, actually, that are the next level of all these things. But if you want to really make sure you cover the basics, that's it. Now, I'm going to tell you, we got about 15 minutes left here on this. And uh, I said, I told Dan I'd, I'd pop this in. We do a whole other webinar on this topic. So I just want to keep it high level for you because the finance part of what we talk about is really done. Okay, that stuff's done. But if you want to bring it into down to activities, I have to show you this, kind of like I had to show you the other stuff in the beginning as well. We do bring it down to scorecard because ultimately it's human beings who get the things done that lead up to your financial metrics. And that's where scorecard comes in. So for scorecard, yes, 90% of people, nine, people are 90% of your success. But how do we know if they're successful and working on what links to our financial plan? And that's where the scorecard comes into play. So this is how it links to finance. We have this issue in my company right now. And we spent about an hour on this topic this morning. The whole question of, are our people doing things on their scorecard that actually create ROI to what return on uh, investment to what we are trying to accomplish? And in our company's case, and we do this for a living, we're looking at some of the activities we're doing and saying, I don't think those have... Uh, there's not a business case for doing some of these things. We're just doing them. And I don't think it's got value actually either to our clients and to us financially. A scorecard keeps you honest and tells you what plays you need to run during your game to hit your targets. So I only spend as much time on this, Dan, as you want me to. I'll give you the high level so we can get some time left here. I'm sure some of you have seen this. We have an entire webinar on our website if you want to download it on this topic, if you want to deep dive for an hour on scorecard. This is a very basic scorecard for one team. It's a 13-week sprint. It's how we recommend we do the years. If you're using an EOS system, they use something very similar to this. I think they have a great scorecard, honestly. Uh, new SQLs, we just do a weekly by goal. We look at it. If, they're on, if each employee is on track for the week, it's green. If it's, they're not, it's red. Why do I link this to finance? Because in these stupid little scorecard numbers, what people don't get is I'm not just trying to score my people. I'm trying to make sure that my business is doing the base things to hit my financial plan. That's how it links to scorecard. So today, when we said we have some issues around some of our things in our, in our financial planning, all we're really saying is what should people be doing or not doing on their scorecards? That's all we're really saying. And we've learned to link that down to that next level. What do we put on there? Once again, you have access to these slides. I'm not going to read all this. Uh, you can see how sales, ops, marketing, finance, once again, we're trying to link this up to the bigger picture. How do you determine the right targets? First, determine what you care about at each level, senior leadership. I'm going to skip through some of this stuff because you can just read it on the slide. But what does matter is on a scorecard is, um, oh, I'm going to go, I'll, I'll wait in a second. It's on the next slide. I'm going to show it to you in a minute. This is an example of one. Okay, this is something... This is a little more advanced. So if you know about scorecard already, uh, you haven't seen this likely. I see a lot of scorecards and they have the activities up top, but they don't have how it links to the dollars on the bottom. This is kind of like advanced class here. I like to put the results of the lagging stuff at the bottom to make sure the upper stuff is actually working. People don't like that. People are like, Eric, why do you track the lagging stuff? Because I don't know if the other crap up top's working unless I can see how it's linking to my metrics. That's why I put it down here. 
The rule of thumb, though, is for scorecard, stuff that you can control is the scorecard. The lagging stuff is telling you, is it actually working or not? And that's why I put it on the slide. Now, this slide does matter, okay, even for the finance part, especially for this right here. The beauty of a scorecard, like I said, totally different topic. The beauty of the scorecard is it's telling me what do each of my team members need to be doing to hit my financial plan? Ultimately, my last slide, my last quote, which Dan very intuitively asked me to, to, to think about. My last slide, I'll give you a little insight into this. As much as I care about the numbers, I don't ever like to get lost in the numbers. I never forget that I can only make a certain amount of revenue and profit if I have enough profitable lemon, lemonade stands. So I've learned I can make all the charts for finances in the world I want, but ultimately I need to know from the scorecard what drives my revenue and profitability. And usually that's happy customers, not spending too much, not making mistakes, and making sure uh, that we're selling enough. So we focus on operations, finance, and um, sales. That's what my scorecards tend to focus on because those three things give me happy customers. They give me uh, happy us because we're making money and they give me happy employees because they can control what they're doing on a weekly basis. And then I always bonus those things towards the financial plan. Home stretch, Dan. Now, remember Steve Showalter, he's the guy I showed you earlier. I gotta get Steve on one of these things. And you should meet Steve at some point, he's a great guy. Uh, his company grew from 2020 to 2022 by 219%. We try and invest, we, we like to invest in our companies if we can. He is one company, I always joke, I cannot believe we did not invest in that company. I knew we should have. He grew, he's grown 219%, 30% point increase in net profit. You did read that correctly. And 325% improvement in enterprise value. And that for him is growing by the day. How did he do it? He dove into his finances to figure out where he was wrong. And he was wrong in a couple of key areas. And finally, he just said, I'm never going to be able to fix this business unless I fix these things. And he did. So that's why you do all this stuff. I hope it's helpful. Uh, I'm sorry if I rambled or showed too many charts. Um, I now do eat all of this dog food. If you spent your day with me, you would say, this guy actually does this stuff. Um, we have about almost 100 employees. And um, and this is the backbone of how I make sure we're doing a good job. So that's what I got, Dan. Uh, th this was even better than I expected because <laughs> I like the back and forth with you and me. Um would you mind, I'm going to have you run me through the last couple of slides as we take this home. Sure. Um, so what what I wanted to do is uh, leave that up for a sec. Um, yep. It is with a spirit of generosity that Eric is here today. Um, Eric makes a living selling this information and selling these consulting services. But look, we know that um, many of you are... Uh, smaller businesses, um, businesses that are struggling to get by, businesses that are mindful of every cent you spend. And the, the truth is that a lot of these concepts um, are easy in conception, just more difficult in execution. And so we don't want you to be held back by not having access to the tools. And we want you to know that companies like Cruise and Company that has my full endorsement are there to help you when you're ready. And yes. so- my strong recommendation is download these tools. Um, if you have a person in your company who's a bookkeeper or an accountant or uh, ideally, you know, a, a CFO or a fractional CFO, fractional chief financial officer, go through these tools with them. You know, one of my pet peeves is that um, bookkeepers and accountants tend to do uh, what I call IRS financials. In other words, they put the financials in a format that's really built for- um, Can't stand it. You're yeah. you know it. Can't stand it. That's exactly- it's, 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 it, it, And what you need are management financials. Yes. What, Dan, what, that's, you, brilliant. that's brilliantly said. What, 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 do, what, do, what do I mean by management financials, Eric? Okay. So I'm so glad you said that. So a moment of vulnerability here. Uh, I love my CPA. 
He's one of the few people in business that I trust with, with, with anything. He's been my CPA for 20 some years. However, when I, when I owned another company, I lost millions of dollars and I had a lot of cash. I needed cash for X, Y, and Z reason. And he would say, he'd say, just take it out if you need the cash. Now he was very busy. So he'd be like, you have cash flow, you're good. And he'd look at the numbers and he'd give me these financials that were based on what he was putting together for the IRS. Uh, and he wasn't being irresponsible, but he wasn't advising me to actually read what the financial statements were telling me. And what happened was I just took too much cash. So my balance sheet went upside down. I looked good on paper. I'm like, how's this happening? He's like, well, Eric, I told you to take cash. I didn't tell you to take that much cash for that long. I'm like, well, we had cash. That's what you said. He said, no, you, you, he's like, my financials were designed for the IRS. You need to figure out cash flow. And by that point in time, I got myself into trouble. And this was 20 years ago at this point. What Dan means is this, your CPA will even take your QuickBooks instance and, and make it this crazy looking thing sometimes. And you're like, what am I going to do with this thing? And you'll actually try and run your business off of it. And your CPA is just trying to maximize your ability to save taxes. And if you're not careful and you think that whatever the CPA gave you are actually your numbers, you could have an issue. So what I've learned is to teach my leadership teams, my, our clients and myself, what does this thing actually even mean? And we need to have a version that is pre-tax, pre-screwed up by them so that I know how to run my company. And that was brilliant, Dan. Like your CPA, if you think your CPA is going to be able to give you this kind of financial advice, I don't mean to ding your CPA. Mine is, ext I'm extremely close to mine. He's a genius. They are not running your business. You need to carry that bag yourself. And that means having your own financial statements. And, you know, one of the things that I, I don't do this and I should, but I did back in the early days of my business is that idea of like, taking the QuickBooks statement and then like pulling out the important numbers and putting them in your own little junior varsity spreadsheet. Yeah. That it's, you know, they often say, you know, you want to work on your business, not in your business. If you are, if you are doing the work of a, of an administrator, you are an administrator, you know, you know, are, are you doing $25 an hour work? You know, there's all these advice to not do certain like mundane tasks I think that if there were like one mundane task that you should do, it's to manually fill out a scorecard, uh, like a, um, oh shoot, what was that tool you called it? It's the- uh, uh, Six and the six. Monthly yeah, monthly the monthly review, review scorecard. Yeah. Like manually fill out that scorecard for the monthly review. I'm glad you said that. It's interesting, um, you know, I have, a I, have a, I have an amazing finance team. I couldn't be prouder of them. Um, they, you know, still, they ding me sometimes. They're like, this is a homegrown tool. The only thing I care about is that it must always link back to the monthly updated QuickBook instance. So if you're going to go manual on a tool, which all of our tools are, uh, you have to make sure that they match up to your closed out QuickBook so that you're not just creating manual tools in a vacuum. But other than that, you're going to notice that all of our tools are basically management financials that we create from QuickBooks. We do not let QuickBooks be the master of us. It, once it closes out every month, we take the information and put it in our own homegrown tool. That's how we do it. I've never found anything on QuickBooks either that's as good. It just doesn't, it's not as intuitive for a small business person when you do it that way. It just doesn't work. Yeah. We're working on stuff to do to fix it right now. We're working on stuff to help small businesses do this because I've been so frustrated with uh, QuickBooks and everything else. Um, you try using that budgeting tool, good luck. It's not easy yeah. to do it. Um, I, I think my, so you can go, yeah, let's wrap up. I think what Myra really, um, you know, uh, keep going. I'm getting yeah. my slide in. Yeah, let's do ahas. Let's pause there for a sec. Um, my big aha is, I don't think I really understood until Myra pointed this out, but what you're actually doing here is you have a lot of financial acumen. You've studied this stuff. You really believe in it. You obviously have hundreds of companies that you've worked with, but you are in the end an entrepreneur and a business owner. And so it, you're, 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 you're communicating it with that perspective. And I really, um, I think that that's often what's missing is most, most, like the vast majority of business owners um, 
are uncomfortable with numbers or a little scared by numbers, a little intimidated by numbers. And, and therefore, you know, we do what we're supposed to do, right, with the stuff that we're not good at, which is we outsource it. But yeah. but that's actually a fatal error. Um, and it could... You got to carry your own bag when it comes to finances. Yeah, especially when it comes to the management financials and those specific metrics that are your North Star that move the business. And, you know, if you're not sure, it's just it's revenue, profit margin, and then, um, you know, some other operational targets that basically help you understand your health um, and cash, you know. Uh, you know, what's also so interesting, Dan, that, and, I, and I, would, I almost made this my quote. One of the things I learned about money, uh, you know, many years ago is that but profitability, it's like a dog. This is how I look at it. This is an analogy I've, I've learned. Some dogs, you take them off the leash, you put them in the yard, and the dog just sits there. You're like, dog's off leash. Dog's good. Dog's not going anywhere. And then other dogs, you take them off a leash, put them down, and they're like, gone. Like, sprinting away, where's the dog? That is money. Money is the dog that if you put it there and you walk out, it's gone. It leaves. Money is not trying to stay in your bank account, especially if you have employees. Money is always trying to leave your bank account. And your job is to safeguard that. I love that. Um, take me home. Take it home um, with the uh, parting thought, please. So this is an interesting parting thought because you just went to a finance presentation and now I'm going to end on this, which is that money, in my opinion, money is a terrible master. Like I... You will meet very few people that have been very successful who did it because they wanted to make a lot of money. Because if that was the case, they would just stop at some point. And certainly there are some greedy people out there, but it's not the case for most entrepreneurs. Money is a terrible, if you want to run a, a fantastic business, focus on being amazing at what you do. Be amazing at what you do. It's like we're a consultant. We come in, we try and fix companies. We do all this stuff. And the biggest question I always ask is, is your service or your product amazing? Because if it's not, I can't fix you. So the master should be the, the, the marketplace. It should be serving them and being amazing at what you do and serving your grand vision. That is the actual master. However, this from P.T. Barnum, who had his own financial problems and probably came up with this in one of those times. It is an excellent servant to have to be able enable you to do what you want to do, which is why we are so passionate about making money an ally for us so that we can do what we actually want to do. And if you don't allow money to be a servant, it will really take you down a bad path. If you do watch it, it'll enable you to literally change the world. I love it. Um, that's such a perfect ending. You know, I don't usually share the, so we do something called the um, net promoter score. And I don't usually share the results, except when we get an 85 net promoter score on a finance presentation, which is the highest of the master classes that we did in season 10 on strategy. And we had some really fun and entertaining uh, topics. So you nailed it. Uh, congratulations. If you could go to the next slide. Um, that's it for season 10 of the BizHack Live Masterclass series. Season 11 is a complete non, you do not want to miss this one. We're going to do AI for content. We're not going to only going to talk about um, how to create content using AI, which everybody talks about. We're going to actually do a really deep dive into how it's changing the face of search marketing. It's honestly the biggest um, innovation in search marketing since the invention of pay-per-click advertising and the dominance of Google over AltaVista from a whole generation ago. I mean, basically, Google has had a clean playing field for almost a generation, unlike any business can ever hope for and expect. And it is all being disrupted right now by generative AI. Um, and B Google is the number one disruptor of its own business um, through uh, search generative results that are starting to appear in their search. So. So much more to talk about about that. We're going to talk about the tools that you can use to create content, how to make sure that they're discoverable. And we're going to do it all with the amazing Jeff Cooper of Saltbox, who many of you might remember from our AI. With that, happy new year, healthy new year. Thank you guys for all that you've done to make us successful. Thank you to Eric and all of the more than 100 masterclass speakers that we've had in the first three years of doing this. Um, this is some of the most important work I've done in my life. When I went to Congress uh, last week to talk about 
how we can help small businesses. One of the things I said is please continue to fund things like this so we can make it free. The businesses that need it most can't afford the help. And so you're doing an amazing uh, service, uh, allowing uh, us to borrow from all of your accrued uh, wisdom, Eric Cruz. And it was a perfect way to end the year. Budget season's coming to an end, guys. Get those forecasts ready. And we'll see you next year when we talk about AI for content. Happy holidays, everybody. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks, Dan. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye.